on World News Tonight. Freedom Day. The world's strictest pandemic measures fall as Melbourne emerges from isolation. Major milestone. Once a COVID-shaken nation celebrates a billion jabs. Taliban tensions. Controversial discussions on regional stability in Afghanistan. Eye of Dubai. The world's tourism powerhouse gets back on its feet with a record-breaking attraction. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with updates on the COVID crisis. Melbourne's residents flock to the city's cafes after the world's most locked down city emerged from its latest spate of restrictions designed to combat the spread of COVID-19. For more on this, we have other there in a World News special correspondent, Timothy Phillip, reporting now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Anuradhi. As Melbourne exits what is touted to be its final COVID-19 lockdown, the city's very residents can be forgiven for losing track of precisely what changes are happening this time around. Both Melbourne and Mildura have left lockdown conditions behind, while other parts of regional Victoria have gained some extra freedoms. While Victorians are still being asked to remain vigilant about practices like wearing masks and social distancing, reaching the initial goal of having 70% of eligible people fully vaccinated has played a big role in reducing the COVID-19 threat. In Melbourne, people were seen cheering and clapping from their balconies while drivers honked their car horns continuously when the lockdown restrictions in place since early August came to an end. Victoria State Premier Daniel Andrews promised there would be no more lockdowns as the state reached its vaccination targets. Slightly more than 70% of adults in Australia are now fully vaccinated and many residents are planning to fly overseas again when international border restrictions are eased next month. Back to you, Anurani. All right, thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Pfizer and BioNTech have said a booster shot of their COVID-19 vaccine restored efficacy to 95.6% against the virus, including the Delta variant, according to data from a Phase 3 trial. On the fence about getting a COVID-19 vaccine booster shot, this might help. Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech said results from a late-stage clinical trial demonstrated a 95.6% efficacy rate of guarding against the virus, including the highly virulent Delta variant. The trial results released Thursday were based on a study of 10,000 participants 16 years old and older. Among those who got the booster shot, only five came down with COVID-19, compared to the placebo group, which saw 109 cases of the disease. The vaccine makers said the median time between the second dose and the booster shot, or the placebo, in the study was around 11 months. The two companies say they will submit data from the trial to the FDA, the European Medicines Agency, and other regulatory agencies as soon as possible. Booster shots from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have been approved in the U.S. and Europe for older populations and for those who are immunocompromised. The FDA also gave the green light on an extra shot of the one-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine and said Americans can choose a different shot from their original inoculation as a booster. We have some good news for you. India, which was once the hardest hit nation from the COVID pandemic, now celebrates a remarkable milestone of administering 1 billion COVID-19 vaccines. India is celebrating the milestone of administering 1 billion COVID-19 vaccine doses with a song and dance. The government on Thursday promoted the achievement with musical and other programs across the country and special illuminations of national monuments even as a recent drop in inoculations worries healthcare providers. Prime Minister Narendra Modi marked the occasion by meeting staff at a hospital in New Delhi. October 21st, 2021 has been scripted in history as India has crossed the 1 billion mark of administering COVID-19 vaccine doses. 
100 करोड़ वैक्सीन डोज का आंकड़ा पार कर लिया है 100 साल में आई Now the country has a strong shield of 1 billion vaccine doses to fight the biggest pandemic in the last 100 years. The World Health Organization, which relies heavily on India for supplies to its global vaccine sharing platform Covax, congratulated the country for reaching the landmark. After a slow start in January, India's immunization campaign has covered three quarters of its 944 million adults with at least one dose, but only 31% have received both doses. Nearly 90% of the vaccines administered have come from the Serum Institute of India. It produces a licensed version of the AstraZeneca drug. The SII has more than tripled its capacity since April and can now produce 220 million vaccine doses a month. Ministry officials are urging people to get vaccinated fast, especially as the ongoing festival season of family gatherings and mass shopping raises the risk of a new wave of infections. Meanwhile, pandemic restrictions are being reinstated in Russia as coronavirus deaths and infections hit a new high in a new surge that the authorities blame on an ineffective and slow vaccination campaign. 20 months on since the beginning of the pandemic, this COVID ward in Moscow is seeing patient after patient come through its doors. The vast majority haven't been vaccinated. Cases have been surging for weeks in Russia. Over the weekend, the daily death toll hit a thousand for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic. The grim milestone has since been surpassed several times this week. Despite being quick to bring out its Sputnik V vaccine, Russia's jab uptake has been slow as many citizens remain reluctant. Only about a third of the population is vaccinated, a source of frustration for health workers on the front line. The Kremlin has ruled out another national lockdown. A concern over the deteriorating situation has pushed President Vladimir Putin to back plans for most Russians to stay off work for at least a week in November in a bid to curb infections, as well as repeat his calls for people to get vaccinated. The official death toll in Russia stands at more than 226,000, the highest in Europe. But the Federal Statistics Agency estimates the figure could be more than 400,000. The World Health Organization has criticized what it describes as a shocking imbalance in the distribution of coronavirus vaccines between rich and poor countries. The WHO is calling out vaccine inequality. According to the World Health Body, the coronavirus pandemic will go on for a year longer than it needs to because poorer countries are not getting enough vaccines. This means the pandemic could easily drag on deep into 2022. According to the Our World Data Project at Oxford University, Just under 8% of the population in Africa has received one dose of the vaccine. That's in stark contrast to other regions of the world. In the U.S. and Canada, 67% of the population have received at least one dose. In Latin America, it's 61%, while Europe has hit 58%, and Asia comes in at 57%. To address the issue, a program to distribute vaccines globally was set up last year, with richer countries pledging to donate doses as well as subsidizing costs for poorer nations. Known as COVAX, its initial goal was to provide 2 billion doses worldwide this year, a target it says it will miss. It's now hoping to have a total of 1.4 billion doses available by the end of 2021. On Monday, the EU said it plans to boost its vaccine donations to the most vulnerable countries. The European Union has exported so far over 1 billion of COVID-19 vaccines to the rest of the world. We delivered around 87 million doses to the low- and middle-income countries through COVAX. So we made good on our promise. However, an analysis by the People's Vaccine and Alliance of Charities show that just one in seven of the doses promised by wealthier nations and pharmaceutical companies is actually reaching its target destination in poorer countries. 
Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Russia and Central Asia power brokers agreed to work with the Taliban to promote security in the region and called on Afghanistan's new leaders to implement moderate policies. Moscow hosted the Taliban for talks in the Russian capital, seeking to assert its influence in the region and push for action against Islamic State fighters, which it says have massed in perennially volatile Afghanistan. Security was a clear priority at Tuesday's conference in Moscow as Russia and other Central Asian powers seek to stem the threat of conflict in Afghanistan, tensions that could undermine regional stability. The Taliban says that security is dependent upon support from the international community. The Kremlin has led calls for providing international aid to Kabul in order to stave off economic collapse. Though last week, Vladimir Putin said that there should be no rush to officially recognize the Taliban as Afghanistan's government. Russia's delegation said on Tuesday that it expects the Taliban to uphold basic human rights and fight terrorism and drug crime, echoing the concerns of governments around the world. As part of the Moscow talks, the ten participating nations called on the UN to hold an international conference to secure economic aid for Afghanistan. The United States chose not to attend the meeting, citing technical reasons, but has said it may participate in future rounds. An explosive EU row with Poland over its rejection of some of the bloc's laws is set to overshadow a two-day summit of European Union leaders. The issue will eclipse the original theme for the Brussels gathering, examining how Europe can cope with the global energy crunch while sticking by ambitious green policies it will brandish at the COP26 climate summit in two weeks' time. Many Poles say their country should make itself heard in the EU. Residents are divided over the Polish Constitutional Court's decision last week that says national law trumps EU law, except in specific circumstances. The EU has tried to block what it sees as Poland's attempt to dismantle its justice system by replacing judges with others who back the ruling party. But the Polish government says the bloc is meddling with its legitimate reforms. There has been talk of Poland quitting the EU, copying the UK with a so-called Polexit. The government, though, denies having such intentions to the relief of local residents. Those who are concerned by the government's reforms hope EU leaders will force Poland to get back in line with its democratic standards. The leader of the Haitian gang responsible for the kidnapping of 17 members of the missionary group from the United States has threatened to kill the hostages if his demands are not met. The new video, shared widely on social media today and apparently shot yesterday, shows the leader of the 400 Mowozo gang, who authorities say is holding the 17 missionaries for a million dollar per person ransom. He says if his demands aren't met, he will shoot them. This morning, gunfire from Haitian police breaking up a roadblock near the Port-au-Prince airport. Minutes earlier, a crowd had gathered, furious with the government amid a spiraling economic crisis, fuel shortages, lawlessness, all-out desperation. We'll occupy the streets until further notice, this man says. Across the capital city, pockets of smoke signal the growing unrest. Humanitarian aid organizations like Doctors Without Borders are struggling to keep operating. Earlier this year, one of their staffers here was shot dead. In the U.S., today, the Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries prayed for the kidnappers, reading a letter from the families of the hostages. We thank him that he is God and ask him to hear our prayers and bring our families home. The families are from Amish, Mennonite, and other conservative communities across multiple states and Canada. After a five-week manhunt, the FBI confirmed with dental records that the partial remains uncovered in a Florida reserve are those of Brian Laundry, the fiancé of murdered blogger Gabby Petito. As crime scene cars cycled through this Florida park all day, the FBI confirming late today with dental records that the partial skull uncovered in this reserve is Brian Laundry's. A sweeping conclusion to a five-week-long manhunt and dramatic search that captured the country's attention. There was no public comment from the FBI or Northport Police, though the Lee County Sheriff's Department from 40 miles away speaking to conditions in the reserve where Laundrie's remains were found. We're talking about water levels up above almost the chest area. 
rattlesnakes, moccasins, alligators. From above, a view of the FBI's evidence response team performing grid level searches in the area where Laundrie's belongings and that partial skull were discovered just 24 hours ago, submerged in water, likely erasing any fingerprints. Former FBI Special Agent Clint Watts says there's one thing working in investigators' favor, a DNA profile of Laundry, who's a person of interest in the disappearance of his fiance, Gabby Petito. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau unveiled a standardized COVID-19 proof of vaccination passport to be issued by provinces and territories that will allow citizens easier domestic and foreign travel. Buckingham Palace said Queen Elizabeth spent a night in hospital for preliminary investigations and returned to Windsor Castle and was in good spirits. Actor Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun on a movie set in New Mexico, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins and wounding director Joel Souza. Hutchins was flown by helicopter to the University of New Mexico Hospital, where she was pronounced dead. China's permanent representative to the United Nations, Zhang Jun, refuted groundless accusations of human rights abuses in Xinjiang at the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. The U.S. House of Representatives voted to approve contempt of Congress charges against Steve Bannon, a longtime aide to former President Donald Trump, for refusing to cooperate with the probe into the deadly attack on the Capitol. New Zealand's first indigenous Maori woman to be named Governor General, Dam Sandy Hero, was formally sworn into the role in Parliament in Wellington. Ending a long dispute over a digital services tax targeting American tech giants, the U.S. and five European countries have finally reached an agreement. European countries will end their digital services tax schemes after the scheduled implementation of global tax reform in two years. The U.S. and five European nations have sealed the deal to resolve a prolonged trade dispute over digital taxes on some of America's tech giants. Bloomberg reported Thursday that the joint statement issued by the U.S., Britain, France, Italy, Spain and Austria states that they've agreed to transition from the existing digital services taxes to the new multilateral solution. It adds they've committed to hold constructive dialogue on the digital services tax that is largely aimed at big U.S. tech firms such as Google, Facebook and Amazon. Under the deal, the five European nations will keep their current digital taxes in place until the OECD brokered Global Tax Agreement comes into force in 2023. Nevertheless, they've agreed to withdraw their digital services tax schemes as part of a sweeping global tax deal agreed earlier this month by nearly 140 countries to adopt a 15 percent global minimum corporate tax and grant some taxing rights on large profitable companies to market countries. In exchange, Washington agreed to drop its planned tariff retaliation against the five countries. Following the agreement, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai said Washington will continue to work with the five governments to ensure the deal's smooth implementation as well as a rollback of the existing digital tax schemes. And finally tonight, Dubai officially inaugurated the world's largest and highest ferris wheel as the city seeks to reinforce its status as a major tourism hub. The observation wheel was officially opened to the public with a lavish drone and fireworks show. Located on the Blue Waters Island, the Dubai Eye, known as Ain Dubai in Arabic, stands at 250 meters tall. It can take 1,750 visitors on one rotation, which takes just over 30 minutes. It is the latest attraction to open in the region's tourism and business hub after the waxwork museum Madame Tussauds opened earlier this week. Dubai is hoping to attract millions to the Expo 2020 World Fair, which opened earlier in October after a year-long delay due to the coronavirus pandemic. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. I'll be back again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.